Hello, and welcome to Virtual Coffee, the Lunch and Learn edition. Virtual's, virtual Coffee's mission is to be a welcoming tech community that allows room and growth for everyone and mentorship at all levels to create meaningful opportunities of learning, leadership, and contribution. You can find out more about us and you can read our code of conduct, which is very important to us at virtualcoffee.io. We are very, very excited today to be getting started with an onboarding to Web3 from Rahat. And a little bit about Rahat, he comes from a background in customer support management and has carved out a career as a front end engineer, an indie hacker, a mental health advocate, a rapper, and a podcaster. I feel like there's like a nice rhythm to that like list of things. I didn't write it, Rahat did, so he, he can have credit. Um, <laughs> despite his long list of activities, he believes that every hustle needs to come with some self-care and promotes that as the founder of a mental health startup, Whimsor, and open source mental health project, the Skylar project. So thank you so much, Rahat, for being here with us today and for onboarding us into Web3. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I have a whole presentation, a few slides, but um, yeah, feel free to ask questions whenever. Um, I know it's probably like a confusing topic, a very new thing, and i um, happy to help you all jump into this rabbit hole that I jumped into a few months ago. Um, I will share my screen. Hit this button. Okay. Cool. Um, is it showing? Nice. All right, so we're gonna be talking about blockchain, crypto, NFTs um, as sort of an intro to Web3, um, how you can kind of get started. Um, I'll be sharing some resources if you wanna like take a step further and like learn uh, how to develop in the space, uh, things like that. This is hopefully just gonna be kind of like a high level overview of some of the concepts just to get you kind of um, onboarded with some of the language and some of the things that people are talking about in this space. Um, so Web3, before I continue, um, the way that I kind of look at Web3 is like, so Web1 was, I guess, the um, read-only sort of web where you had like a bunch of HTML documents. Um, you just see some websites, you read some stuff, and that's pretty much it. Web2 is kind of like, your Twitters and Facebooks and all that, where you can actually interact with stuff. And uh, there's like both the reading and writing um, transactions, not transactions, that's later, reading and writing stuff um, that happens so like databases and all that. And it's more interactive, right? Now, Web3 is where um, we have this concept of like actual transactions that are native to the space happening. And um, we're gonna, this whole thing is sort of like gonna break that down a little bit. Um, so the things that we're gonna be covering are first off, like what's a blockchain, uh, wallets and tokens, dApps or decentralized applications, and then the most controversial one, NFTs. Um, unfortunately, we will not go over Lambos or go to the moon. Uh, we may go to Mars, but that's a separate thing. Um, so we're just going to start off with like a demo of how blockchains work. Uh, I'm going to send this um, out to everybody afterwards. So like the links and the demo stuff, you'll have access to that uh, to play around with uh, later. But for now, I'm just going to go and open this demo here. Uh, this is a complete demo on like how blockchains work. And let me zoom in so you can see it. So we're gonna start off with the concept of a hash. Um, a hash is basically like this cryptographical um, version of some data. So like if I typed my name in here, the hash ex uh, associated to my name is this large chunk of numbers and letters. Um, you don't really, I don't feel, I'm not like a cryptographical expert, so I don't know like the deeper inner workings of this. This is kind of just to give you a visualization of like what goes on on the blockchain. 
Um, so you start off with these things called hashes, which are just your data, right? The next piece of this is a block. A block is just a bunch of data, right? Um, so blocks are all numbered. They all have a certain number. They have what's called a nonce, which is a number that is only used once. Um, whenever um, a, and we'll talk about mining in a second, but um, the blockchain exists because we have these wonderful people called miners who set up their computers to validate all of our transactions um, whenever we want to interact with Ethereum. So let's say I added in my name in here again. You'll see that it just went red um, because I added in some new data. Um, this is just to signify that this transaction has not been mined yet, which means that someone with a computer running a, what's called like a node of the Ethereum blockchain has not gone through this and actually validated that this is a thing that should be on the blockchain yet. Um, so I'm sending this data, which is my name. And if I mine this thing, you'll see that the nonce just updated. The nonce updated because um, the hash that is associated with my name has to be like cryptographically calculated to figure out what this message in here is. And like the name says, it's a number that's only used once. You can't have the same number being used for an empty space as my name. So the whole point of this is to figure out what this nonce is so that this can be added to the blockchain, right? So if I were to like go in and change the number of this block, it's red again. And if I remine it, the nonce changes because now we're on a different block. So th these blocks all have um, information about where their location is on a blockchain, uh, a specific nonce, some data and some hash, the hash that represents that data. So now let's put that together onto a blockchain. So you have these different um, blocks that are all, you'll see, are linked to one another. So you'll see like a previous value and a hash value. You'll see this previous value is the same thing as this hash value over here. So one block is always connected to the block that comes before it, as well as the block that comes after it, kind of like a linked list. Um, so what will happen here is let's say I want to add my name uh, in here. Let's mine that transaction. Um, that's green, so that's been mined. But you'll notice that this one is still red because it's still referring to the old hash that was um, originally there. So I have to remine this to make sure that this is not referring to the new hash over here. And um, that's like how this block, how like the blockchain works. You have some data that you add to the front of the chain, just to start off, um, and then anything after it will always be referring to the data that came before it, so that if you change anything in the past, you kind of break the entire blockchain. So you cannot change anything that's in the past. It's like completely immutable. Um, if you change it, then you're just on a different blockchain, different like set of data, um, different entire kind of like think about it as like the multiverse. You're in a different universe altogether. And um, you're not just, you're not on that same blockchain. So because it's immutable, you always have to make sure any updates to your data, you always have to go all the way to the end of the blockchain and add it there so that there's always a historical record of all of the data that's ever existed on the blockchain. So that's blockchain in a nutshell. And then we have this um, distributed sort of idea, distributed blockchains. So you have different peers or different, I guess, miners or people who are keeping track of the blockchain. So if I were to go through each of these and say Rahat is cool, I'm going to add it to peer B as well. I'm just going to mine this, mine that uh, mining. It's taking some time to mine. 
So you'll see I mined this. Um, I got a little nonce. So I got a hash. And because I did the exact same thing here, the nonce should be the same, as well as the hash is the same, because it's the same data at the same uh, area of the block. This is block one. This is also block one. These are just two peers keeping track of what's going on on blockchain, right? But what if peer C says Rahat is not cool? We say Rahat is not cool, which is not true. You'll see that the nonce here is different. The hash is also different. So how do we decide which blockchain is correct? Which peer has the correct data? You can so you look basically at all of the other peers and you consolidate that data. Like, okay, so peer A says Rahat is cool. Peer B says Rahat is cool. Peer C says Rahat is not cool. Two out of three wins, Rahat is cool. Um, so if you're trying to do some like weird stuff, you're going into the blockchain to like, change some data that historically happened in the past because you want to, you know, scam people and stuff. Um, it's a lot harder to do that because not only do you have to update it here, as well as every single blockchain that came after it, you also have to make sure that all of these other peers also have your new uh, updated data. So like, it's almost, it's super hard to like, do anything fraudulent, um, at least in that sense of like going back, changing transactions, changing data that's you know happened in the past. Um, and there's like a good level of safety there that the blockchain gives you. So why do you care? Um, what does this have to do with cryptos, Lambos, and NFTs? What this um, this data or this is this is kind of like the underlying. Um, technology that powers things like Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, and all that. Uh, the data itself here, we're just, you know, we've just got some strings, but the data itself can be like a ledger of transactions, which is how you get your cryptocurrencies, um, can be JPEGs, can be anything, um, whatever you want it to be. And these are like the different use cases of like putting different types of data on the blockchain and using it for, um, you know, whatever, use cases that you have. Um, I do want to maybe stop there for a second. Does anyone have any like blockchain questions? Uh, I had a quick question. I dropped it in the chat. Uh, what's a Lambo? A Lamborghini, a very expensive car. Oh, okay. Okay. You were talking about a car. Okay. I thought you yes. meant it in the context of like, I thought it was some special <laughs> addition to the blockchain. <laughs> okay. It is just what I thought it is. Then. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> Kirk has his hand raised. Yes, I do. Um, Just to, I don't know, maybe you covered this at the beginning and I didn't quite get it, but what, so what we're looking at here right now is sort of a, like a, I don't know, call it like a sort of self-contained blockchain implementation right okay so like this just for in, in in the context of this site under the hood like it's like maintaining sort of the same structures that you would see in a like fully distributed blockchain but just here exactly and, right okay and let's say i wanted to access like one of the more popular ones that want like they you know it's just that's just done not just on like a single instance or a single server level, but just like fully, fully distributed. Correct. Cool. Matt. Yeah, thanks. Is uh Rod, is is mining the process of taking the data and generating the nonce? Exactly. Yeah. The nonce is, is, is like, yeah, the nonce is the end value of like what yeah. the miner is trying to get to. Um, yeah. So yeah, you're taking that data and generating that nonce. So when people talk about like you know, mining as a process of solving little programming puzzles, really there's there's some sort of criteria the nonce has to satisfy that has like some level of difficulty of generating and mining is the process of taking that data and finding that nonce and presumably the first computer to do that mined the exactly. blockchain. But yeah, yep. is that okay? Cool. That's cool. Yep. I also have a question in the chat. Um, is a blockchain a data structure? 
So I guess you could look at like the blocks themselves as a data structure. Um, maybe the blockchain as like a database, basically, if you want to refer to it as that. Um, so each of these blocks is like the actual data structures that hold all of the things that you want them to hold. And we've got another question. Is it possible that someone could have a majority of servers working for them that could wrongly change the consensus values for the chain? I think at this point, it's probably extremely hard to do that um, be just because of the number of people that are currently um, mining um, the blockchain, so like all over the world. Um, you could, in theory, create a new blockchain and then, you know, have a bunch of miners, I guess, under your control, maybe, or whatever. But um, doing something like that would be extremely difficult. Could I jump in for a second? That was my question. Yeah. Um, how many miners are out there? Is there a number known for that? I think there's a known number. Um, I, I can't tell you right off the top of my head, but um, there's a very significant number. There's like entire buildings of people doing this stuff. Millions or tens of millions or hundreds of thousands? Probably in the millions, yeah. And like more and more people are doing it like every day. Um, so it's numbers just going up. Um. Kind of follow up to, to Matt's question. So, I mean, so if we think about something like the blockchain that supports things like Bitcoin, that's like obviously massive. Hmm. But say I, Kirk, I'm like, I'm going to make my own currency, Kirk coin. It's going to be great. And Kirk coin did not work out. <laughs> yeah, what happened to Kirk coin? We, we have lost. Kirk Quinn. That's it. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that's all the questions for now. If Kirk pops back on, I'll ask him to put it in the in the chat. Cool. Sounds good. All right. So that is the underlying um, technology. Um, there's a YouTube link in the slides that I found. Uh, to be super helpful for like explaining this in like just like another way. Um, so when I send out the slides, you'll have access to that as well, um, just as like another sort of explanation of all this blockchain stuff. Cool. Um, so one thing that I'd mentioned as a use case for the blockchain is like a ledger of financial transactions. Um, and this is kind of like how we've came to have things like Bitcoin, um, Ethereum, that sort of thing. Now, um, there are a ton of different um, types of cryptocurrencies. You have Bitcoin, Ethereum, which are two of the more popular ones. You have different like doggy meme coins like Doge and Shiba Inu and all that. And um, yeah, there's some coins that have like a lot of utility, some that are just kind of trying to cash in on like the whole hype. Um, I'm not here to tell you what to invest in or what to um, you know, buy. Um, definitely do your due diligence. Um, I personally um, work a lot with Ethereum, so I have a bunch of Ethereum, but um, there are different um, use cases for different cryptocurrencies. You'll have to kind of do the research to figure out like what each of them kind of do. Um, I like Ethereum because it was one of the first or maybe was the first um, uh, currency that allowed you to like build applications on top of that blockchain. Um, so a lot of my learnings have been Ethereum based. Um, so first off, like how do you actually get any of these cryptocurrencies? Um, there are websites out there like Coinbase, I think Robinhood lets you do it too. Um, and like different exchanges online where you can like basically exchange US dollars for um, coins for Ethereum. Um, you do have the option of just like kind of leaving it on those exchanges, but that would not be very decentralized. You should 
move your money into a place where you own it and is not controlled by a corporation or um, an exchange that can at any point in time pull the rug out from under you and take all your crypto. Um, which is where wallets come into play. Where do I put my crypto? Uh, I'm going to give you a quick demo of one of the wallets that I use. Uh, it's called MetaMask. Uh, MetaMask is a very popular one. Um, it is comes in like a little browser extension form. Did the browser extension show? Yes, it did show this time. Um, so you'll see here that I have 18 ETH. I don't actually have 18 ETH. This is a test network. I wish I had 18 ETH because um, that would be a lot of money. But um, you'll see here, I'm on what's called the Rink. I don't really know how this is pronounced. I think it's Rinkaby. Some people say Rinkaby and some people say Rinkaby, but I like Rinkaby, so I'll just say Rinkaby. <laughs> Um, it's one of the uh, test Ethereum networks where you can basically get like a bunch of, um, I guess what are called, I guess like test currency, um, so fake coins uh, that you can use to like test out your applications uh, because it can get very expensive to deploy a, um, a, decent, a, a DAP onto like um, Ethereum and um, this lets you kind of like play around with things and put it on, on an actual like test blockchain um, without having to spend a lot of money. Um, there are things called faucets, uh, which you can just like a Google for like a rink B test uh, faucet. Um, you go on there, do some verification and they will just send you like a bunch of coins to uh, develop with. And um, so that's how I got these 18 ETHs um, through one of those faucets. And you'll see that I've got like a bunch of different um, transactions here. These are just like different contracts I've been working with. Um, and there's a bunch of different test networks. There's like, you have your like Ethereum main network. Um, there's these different test networks. Um, there are what's called like layer two networks, which are um, different Ethereum solutions or stuff that are built on Ethereum solutions that make it more scalable, more scalable and eco-friendly. Um, so I've been messing around with some of these as well. Um, one popular one that came out is called Arbitrum. Uh, this one is also very popular. It's called Matic, which is um, associated to a company called Polygon. Um, they do like a lot of um, cheaper deployments and transactions. Um, the reason they say cheaper is because like those transactions that we talked about when I was doing the blockchain demo, in order to mine those transactions, it costs money. Uh, you have to pay the people who are mining this for you. Um, otherwise, they just wouldn't give you all that computing power for free. Um, so those, those fees are what's called gas. Um, gas is, gas prices can vary depending on how many people are using the network all at once. Um, again, there was like a while, um, like a few weeks ago where gas was abhorrently high because every other day there was like an NFT drop that people were trying to interact with. And um, yeah, so that can go up and down. That's one of the issues that are, that are making people wonder like, is Ethereum really scalable? Can it be used on a mass scale? Um, and that's why these other solutions like Polygon and other what are called layer two um, options exist so that you can have like not completely gasless, but very little gas transactions to the point where it doesn't really matter. And um, essentially um, creating like a layer two over the blockchain where like you can have another blockchain where actual transactions occur. And then Ethereum just kind of like houses all the data um, so that things are more sustainable, eco-friendly. Um, I do have like another lunch and learn I'll probably submit just going more and in further into details about like how to create more eco-friendly blockchain applications uh, because that is a huge concern uh, with the space as it is right now. Um, but they there are tools that already exist that are already out to help kind of mitigate that. So yeah, I've got um, MetaMask wallet. 
Um, there are other types of wallets, mobile wallets. I think MetaMask has a mobile application too. Um, one nice one that I'm really trying to try out is Rainbow, um, which has a really nice UI, but I don't think it's out for Android yet. And I'm an Android user and they don't love us. So hopefully at some point there will be one, but definitely um, those are good places to hold your crypto. Um, you can also buy like um, hardware wallets, um, which are kind of like little USB drives you connect to your computer and you put your crypto onto that hard drive. Um, just a, another way of housing all of your stuff. Um, so that's a wallet. Uh, you do need a wallet to interact with um, the different um, applications that exist in the, in the Web3 space um, because everything is like transaction-based kind of. If you're interested in building um, these dApps, there are a couple of different routes you can take with that. Um, if you wanna build on Ethereum, um, a couple of things you would want to learn are probably Solidity. Uh, Solidity is a programming language for making what are called smart contracts. Um, smart contracts are just, it's just code that executes like stuff on the blockchain. That's really like the um, easiest way of looking at it, I think. Um, some of the other um, tools under Ethereum I've listed are like Hard Hat and Truffle. Hard hat, you can kind of think at of like if you're if you're familiar with like Node um, and Express, it's kind of like the Express of um, sort of Solidity development for like JavaScript users. It's like a, a Java it has it's a JavaScript uh, framework for helping you build smart contracts. You're still doing like um, Solidity code, but the um, Everything is like imported into JavaScript files. Um, you use like bash commands to deploy onto uh, the blockchain and things like that. So it's like helpful for um, running, deploying, debugging um, Solidity code. Uh, you can also look into another cryptocurrency called Solana, which is gaining a lot of um, popularity. Um, it is more at the moment, more eco-friendly than Ethereum. Um, and lets you um, have like very low gas transactions. Um, to develop on a, uh, Solana, you'll need to know some Rust. Um, and then they have their own um, framework called Anchor, which will also help you kind of like similar to Hard Hat and Truffle of like deploying, running, um, code and that sort of thing. Um, the last thing I want to just mention really quick is that there are a lot of um, currencies that are built on what's called the uh, Ethereum virtual machine, which just means um, you can use Solidity um, to write in those cryptocurrencies. Um, I think some examples, I think Arbitrum, like I mentioned before, is one of those examples, but um, there's, there's a lot of those. Um, and it just basically means you can use your Solidity code in those um, languages and I mean, in those cryptocurrencies. So there's quite a lot of those. If you're interested in like doing a bigger deep dive into these concepts, these are some resources that I've used. Um, these are all free, well, sort of free. Um, Crypto Zombies is completely free. It is like an introduction to Solidity. It takes you through um, like actually building out your own smart contracts. Um, and what you do is build out this zombie factory that um, creates zombies that can um, eat crypto kittens. And um, basically, yeah, they, they become zombies too, I think, or something like that. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's just a really fun way of learning um, Solidity. Um, you write all the code to actually have the zombies do their thing. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really cool introduction to Solidity itself if you just want to cover like the fundamentals and basic concepts. Um, once you've done that, you've got a little bit of Solidity. I highly recommend checking out Build Space. Um, I think um, a couple of you might actually be in an upcoming cohort. Um, I did two of their cohorts. Um, I did their introduction to Solidity and like um, Web3 development and building smart contracts. Like they have you build a smart contract, connect it to a front end, deploy it on a test network and everything. So you get to go through the whole process. Um, 
they usually do it with like starting off as a there's like a kickoff live stream and then you can do like a bunch of co-working sessions with other people in your cohort um, as you go through the um the course which is like text-based and video-based um combination of the two this is also completely free um definitely check that out the third thing that I wanted to mention is developer DAO. Uh, the concept of a DAO is another lunch and learn. There's like a whole thing there, but uh, developer DAO was started by um, Nader Dabit. He's a, um, I forget the term, a developer advocate. Why, how did I forget that? Um, a developer advocate uh, who works at a Web3 startup called Edge and Node. Um, he started this as like a way for people to who are interested in, um, you know, Web3 development to come together, a bit of a community, learn from each other and things like that. This one is kind of free, kind of not. Um, in order to get in, you have to mint an NFT, um, which is free, but you have to pay for the gas. Um, and I think that's a perfect segue into NFTs. Um, but before we get into NFTs, any questions so far about these resources or anything else? We've got one question in the chat. What's the minimum skill set for build space? Um, if you know JavaScript, you know uh, React, and um, if you've done like the first lesson on crypto zombies, I think you'll have a decent time at understanding things. And what benefits will you get from building dApps? So, um, I mean, you can look at it the same way as building regular apps, um, just getting some, you know, experience in the space. Um, in this case, you're just building like a decentralized application. Um, dApps are built on the blockchain, so you get the benefits of like the immutability of the blockchain, um, things like that. And hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> I'm gonna also throw a link um, for Decentology Dapp Starter in the chat. They're our sponsor for Hacktoberfest this month. And so they've got some cool stuff you can check out with their Dapp Starter and in their Discord. I think, let's see. Do you have to know front-end development to build dapps? Theoretically, no. You can just like stick to um, smart contract development. So just like building the actual smart contracts and leaving like the UI bits to, you know, front end devs. Um, so if you just want to kind of like stay in like the solidity space or the rust area or wherever, that's just kind of like the back endy kind of stuff. Um, you can definitely do that. I think this uh, build space is more probably like a sort of a full stack blockchain development course. All right, that's good. We're ready to move on. Cool. So the last part of this is NFTs or non-fungible tokens. Um, so this is a hot topic, the last, the last topic that we'll cover. Um, NFTs are, so going back a bit, um, what does NFT stand for? Non-fungible token. What does that mean? Um, a fungible token is something Let's say I had like a $5 bill and Becca had a $5 bill and we exchanged our $5 bills. We both still have $5 bills, right? Um, there's no real difference in our exchange of what we did. And NFT is, so, so that's like a fungible token, that $5 bill. Um, an NFT is something that's more like one, one of a kind, right? You have this super rare signed baseball card that is like, encased in some like super high tech thing so that it never deteriorates or whatever, that is a non-fungible token. Um, only one of that thing exists and um, it has some value or some uh, utility or whatever. And the most popular use case of NFTs at the moment is um, all of these like kind of profile pictures and um, different art and JPEG stuff that you're seeing. Um, so a lot of people kind of equate NFTs to just being JPEGs, 
which is not the case. Um, NFT is refer referring to like a store of data or value on the blockchain, which can be a JPEG and is generally a JPEG in our current um, crypto online world, um, but it does not have to be. A ticket to a concert can be an NFT. A medical records can be NFT. Um, a deed to a house can be an NFT. And these are all cool use cases that you can probably use outside of just JPEGs for like um, ways that NFTs can actually be helpful in the real world. Because if you have some like immutable deed uh, regarding like a house, there's like a, a more guarded sense of ownership, but like who owns that house. So if there's like any disputes in like a family type of um, thing, the NFT just tells you like, no, this is the person that owns it. Um, and one, um, one thing that I personally um, enjoy about NFTs and that I'm doing a lot of research into is like creating like a gaming economy um, around NFTs. Um, my current project in NFTs, I'm not going to show it. If you want to learn more about it, you can talk to me, but um, is around gaming and NFTs. And um, I think that's an incredible kind of use case for it. If you've ever played a game and bought like, I don't know, like a power up or a weapon for your character or anything like that, you've essentially bought an NFT. Um, it, that, that the whole concept of an NFT has existed for a very long time. It's just been popularized now with like these different um, JPEGs and stuff that are out there. Now, a lot of people see, see, can see NFTs at scams. There are lots of scams among NFTs. Lots of NFTs don't actually have any utility and value. Again, that is up to your due diligence and seeing like what this NFT represents, what um, utility you get from it, because um, there are some pretty cool ones. I think like Gary V put out one called uh, V Friends, where like if you own one of these V Friends, you can like FaceTime with him once a year. Um, and that's like one one way that I've seen that like artists are like musicians are trying to uh, like capitalize on for like their fans um, and create like a new revenue stream um, for them. So there's lots of different things like that you can do that I feel are great for creators, um, both like in the art industry, music industry, wherever it is. And like I said, they don't have to be JPEGs. They can be music, they can be videos, they can be concert tickets. Um, any of these kind of utilities. The cool thing that I see with them using being used as like stuff like concert tickets is like um, it becomes much harder to actually sell fake concert tickets uh, because if you buy an NFT, um, you can't just like create a new like someone can't sell you an NFT that's on that that um, that is on that blockchain or that. Um, wherever that smart contract lives, you can easily verify like using the address of that um, um, that ticket, whether it actually gives you access to the concert or not. Um, so that's another uh, use case that I would love to see in the future. Um, another one, I've worked on a small project where uh, people are verifying ownership of NFTs to like get into special events, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do with NFTs beyond just being a JPEG. Um, again, if you ever want to purchase an NFT or buy one, just look into the community, look into what they're doing with it um, before you do so. Um, and that will probably help you stay away from the rug pulls and scrams that exist out there uh, because there are plenty of those. Um, and yeah, I mean, the last thing that I kind of want to end with is actually minting an NFT together. Um, I would like to thank Kirk for allowing me to mint this one. We've, wait, uh, we can we can we pause before this yes. just real quick because we had a question um, in the chat. Does so if if we have a deed of a house NFT right mm -hmm. and the house is sold, can it be updated and still non fungible? 
Yeah. So basically the ownership of that NFT would be transferred to someone else. So um, the ownership of that NFT is not, I guess, like, um, it's like, it depends on which wallet, I guess, that it lives in. So if I were to transfer that from my wallet to, I don't know, Becca bought a house for me and I transferred it to her wallet, Becca now has that NFT in her wallet and that signifies her ownership of that house. Awesome. Now for the big reveal. So um, here is a website for like looking up um, different NFTs that you might want to buy or invest in. It's called OpenSea. It's one of the more popular ones. Um, we're going to go over not to the regular OpenSea, but to testnets.opensea because I don't want to spend any actually money doing this. Um, but so we're on a testnet. I think I have it connected to my ring fee. I do. Cool. Um, so you can go on OpenSea right now and basically for free, um, create your own NFT and try to sell it. So OpenSea accepts like these different file types. It can be a JPEG, PNG, GIF, SVG, um, whatever. Um, there's a really cool way to make it accept um, HTML files. Um, I don't think you can do that natively through here, but if you like write a bunch of smart contract code, you can actually mint an HTML file as an NFT and create some really cool stuff with it, um, which is another thing I'm experimenting with. But um, let's add an item. We're going to, what did I name it? I think I named it legend, yes. So we have this NFT here, um, which is a legendary tweet by our very own Kirk. Why is, I really hate that it cropped it this way and you can't see Kirk's actual tweet. No. <laughs> okay, so this was Kirk's legendary tweet of um, creating a uh, function named Missy Elliott and then Missy Elliott actually responded to that tweet. So we're gonna name it legendary tweet. Um, you can have like some external link, maybe like a detail page for the item. Maybe you want to link to the actual tweet itself. I'm going to leave it blank for now. Um, you can put in a description. It's like Kirk's legendary tweet. Even though we're minting this, technically you can buy it if you have some rink B test ETH. So it won't actually be worth anything, but you can technically buy this. Um, so some NFTs have like different properties or traits. So if you've ever seen like those, um, different, like board apes or, um, cyberpunks, they all kind of look the same, but have different traits of like different eyewear, different, uh, colors or different, um, facial expressions or things like that. These are like the different traits, um, and things that can be, uh, put into this area here. Again, like this is just like the UI. This is not a good way to like actually put out a full collection. You want to do that through code um, because I don't know if you want to do this for like 10,000 different images, which is what a lot of these um, things are. Um, but we'll say there's a supply of one. Um, you'll see which blockchain um, you're putting this out on. I'm putting this out on Rinkby. Um, looks like they for test networks, they um, support these other two um, networks as well. Um, freeze metadata. So you can have metadata on your NFT that is both um, like, what's, it, what's the word again? Um, not static, <laughs> that word. Dynamic. There we go. That was the word I was looking for. Thank you, Becca. Um, you can have like dynamic meta metadata so that like your um, NFT can like technically update in a way, um, which I find cool. Like there are um, some NFT drops where like you have some image, some placeholder image, and then sometime later you see the actual NFT um, that you minted. Um, and it's like part of a whole reveal thing that they do. 
So um, you can have um, like an initial link for a placeholder image and then the actual NFT link kind of like in there. But we'll just create this for now. And hopefully once we mint it, um, you'll see the full, yay, you can see the full thing. Cool. So this is an NFT of Kirk's legendary tweet. Um, and I'm gonna, can I set, you can actually come in here and offer me some fake rink B ETH for this. I will link this in the chat so y'all can check it out. But yeah, um, that's how you would mint like your own NFT if you just wanted to get something out uh, onto the world. Um, some of the resources like BuildSpace has an actual full course on like how you can do this with code. Um, because like I said, no one wants to do this 10,000 times. Um, but yeah, that is the end of the Web3 onboarding. Um, happy to take any more questions. Um, Got a couple or... of questions in the chat. Um, so let's see, one of the questions is, could you associate an NFT with a physical item like a handbag so if you want to say like, this is a designer handbag and you can validate that with an NFT, does it work like that? Um, in theory, yes. I think I've seen a few people try something like that. Um, I think what might be like, what I feel is probably a better use case for like physical goods is like, maybe if there's like a popular drop, like um, of like, it's impossible to buy a PS5 still. Maybe you can like have an NFT um, sold to people and they can use that NFT to claim a PS5. Um, and I think a use case like that where you use the NFT to like claim an item is probably better um, because if you have like some physical good with it and you sell the NFT, like there's nothing preventing you from just still keeping that physical good for yourself. Um, so yeah, there's that. I think Disney's going to use it for fast pass at all their parks. That's you get cool. the Disney fast pass NFT. Um, we've got another question in the chat and then we'll go over to Nick. But the question was, why is it called non-fungible if you can ultimately exchange it like buying and selling a house like a fungible item? So the item itself is non-fungible, but like the ownership of it can change, can be transferred around. Um, I can, like, if you're looking at like a very rare, um, one of a kind baseball card, let's say, like if I give you or sell you the card, um, you're now the owner of it, but the item itself hasn't changed. Um, the item itself is still the same thing. So uh, yeah, I, I think that might be a good way to sort of think about it. Awesome. I like that. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I had a question about the test nets and stuff. I, I'm still new to all this stuff. Uh, so I have my I have my MetaMask and I have an actual like account on the main net. And I I went through one of Natter's tutorials, so I I did use the test nets. But what can is it? What happens if like say I used my actual account that has my real ETH in it. And just like, if I accidentally, you know, you can switch like in MetaMask, you can switch the, the nets, uh, the networks. Uh, what if I accidentally was using my my real ETH account in the test net? Like I imagine the fake ETH would get added there, but it's not real ETH. So I'm, I, I don't know if, I'm, I feel like somebody's probably done this by accident. So I'm just curious what would happen uh, in that case, it's like, do those do those transactions just become invalid or not even appear on the main net? Or so um, those those transactions would wouldn't even be able to happen because they are on different okay. networks. Um, so they're not okay. actually compatible. Okay, so just the fact that my account was created on the main net, it it knows right away. It it, it can't right. operate on this. Okay, so built in safety. So yep. nice. All right, I think that's all the questions in the chat. I'll just give another second. If you have a question, go ahead and you can unmute or raise your hand. 
have one last quick one, but uh, I don't know if you'll have the answer for this or not, Rahat. But so I have old coworkers that work in the crypto space and it's all about like hard wallet and like cold wallets because it's the safest. Mm -hmm. But I, I read up a bit and like MetaMask doesn't currently support cold wallets. Like I, I noticed they have a PR or there's like discussions in the in the repo for it. Uh, I'm wondering what that means for folks using MetaMask right now. Like if, you know what I mean? Like how safe it is, is it if if it's just a soft uh, hot wallet and not a cold wallet? Yeah, I think um, like my, I guess my opinion of it is like, you would probably just want to put whatever funds in MetaMask that you feel comfortable just like using probably on a regular basis. So kind of thinking about it as like MetaMask would be like your the wallet that you carry around with some cash, um, you know, on you as a person. And okay, okay. That's, you know, where you do your main transactions. And then maybe your cold wallet would be like your, I don't know, your bank or something where you put like the majority of your funds. Okay, gotcha. So kind of like checking savings account yeah like if we go with the old school analogy okay cool cool all right thanks all right well i think that's it rahat thank you so much that was a lot of information you did a really good job of explaining it oh man my zoom is <laughs> losing its mind it just <laughs> like four four things pop up about it so um Excellent. <laughs> Thank you again so much. Uh, if you're watching this, you can find Rahat on Twitter. Um, what is your Twitter handle? It is at Rahat Codes. And that will be linked in the YouTube video. Uh, thanks for watching this. You can find out more about us on virtualcoffee.io. You can come hang out on Tuesday or Thursday. Bye.